The broadcast is now starting. All attendees Hi, good are evening. in listen Welcome to this Goodfellow webinar on vascular emergencies in primary care. Um, so I'm Miriam Nakatsuji. I'm a part-time GP in South Auckland and I work um, at the Goodfellow unit and teach at the medical school. Um, this evening I'm joined by Mr. Venu Bamidi, who is a vas vascular and endovascular surgeon at uh, Auckland City Hospital. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, so Venu is, uh, he is the clinical lead of the Auckland Regional Diabetic Foot Service um, and is a visiting vascular surgeon for Waitamata and Northland DHBs. Tonight we're going to be looking at, or Venu will be talking to us about vascular emergencies, so conditions that we um, as GPs are pretty scared about and, don't, and hope that we don't see in our practices, um, but things that we need to be able to recognise. So we will be mainly focusing on... Um, how to recognise these conditions, how they might initially present to us in primary care. Um, Vera will also mention things like some initial steps that we might be able to take, um, but generally these are conditions in which we're going to have to transfer people to hospital urgently. A webinar works best if we can have a bit of interaction, so we would like you to be able to text your questions to Venu as we go. Uh, the talk is divided into five different condition um, topics. So when we're talking about aneurysms, if you could text your questions about aneurysms at the time, and I will put those questions to Venu as we go. If we don't get to your question at the time, we will also have some more Q&A towards the end. Before I hand over to Venu, I'm just going to bring your attention to a couple of things that we have um, at the Goodfellow Unit website. So this is goodfellowunit.org. If you haven't been to the website before, you just need to register once, which is free, and then you have access to a range of different CME. So at the top left here is our online catalogue, where we have a range of different um, e-learning courses. So you do a bit of reading, do a quiz, and then you can get a printable CME certificate. Just below that, Goodfellow Events is where you can find information about upcoming events, such as a free Women's Health Day coming up in Auckland on the 19th of November. Um, annual Symposium, so later on we'll be putting the program there for our March um, 2017 Symposium. Um, and below that, in the Goodfellow Clinics, um, you'll find podcasts, gems and webinars. So the webinars from previous webinars, if you don't manage to make it on the night, you can have a look at the webinar at a later time um, just by clicking on here. Uh, gems, here are some examples of some recent gems. So these are chosen by Goodfellow Director Dr. Bruce Errol, um, who looks at the, the journals for latest evidence, looking for things that are relevant to general practice and either practice changing or practice maintaining. You can either just look at these on our website or get these emailed to you every couple of weeks. Um, podcasts, here is an example of some of the recent podcasts. We've now got about 40 of these on the website. A lot of them are only 20 to 30 minutes long, so it's a good way of just doing some um, brief CME when you've got a bit of time. You can just listen to them from your desktop or use a smartphone app um, to listen on the go. Something new um, that we've just started is a YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and uh, look for uh, put in Goodfellow Unit, we so far have about 16 videos up there, and these are all local specialists who spoke at the 2016 Goodfellow Symposium. Um, they're about 45 minutes long. You can see the speaker plus the presentation slides. So another way in which you can do some online CME. Um, so coming back to the webinar now, um, just remember to type in your questions as we go and I will hand over now to Venu to get us started. Thanks. Thanks Miriam. So good evening everyone, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. This, this talk um, on vascular emergencies and urgent conditions is um, in similar vein to the one that I presented earlier this year at the Goodfellow uh, Symposium. Um, so I hope you find it reasonably useful. Please do uh, get your questions through. So a quick introduction about me. So full disclosure is that I'm Australian um, and 
uh, trained in various parts of Australia, uh, New Zealand and uh, overseas. And I started here a few years ago now, um, with my main area of interest really being minimally invasive um, endovascular interventions for aneurysms, veins um, and peripheral arterial disease. And as Miriam mentioned, um, I look after the Regional Diabetic Foot Service for Auckland, um, as well as the upcoming uh, Mercy Ascot Wound Service. So the topics I thought I'd cover today really um, are about acute limb ischemia, aneurysms, um, aortic dissection, mesenteric ischemia, and if we get time, um, interest trauma. So we'll start with acute limb ischemia. Uh, it's probably the most common out of all those listed. So acute limb ischemia is defined as a sudden deterioration in perfusion of the limb, and it's broadly classified or separated into embolism versus thrombosis. There are a few other causes of ischemia, acute limb ischemia that are uncommon or rare, um, so we'll just focus on those two groups uh, for today. The immediate management in the pre-hospital setting um, and even on arrival to hospital, the initial management is pretty much the same or similar, but the actual therapeutic and intervention options are usually quite different. Um, and what most people are aware or know about acute limb ischemia is it comes down to the six P's really, which is really pain, pallor, paresthesia, paralysis, pulselessness, um, and the other P is either porcolithemia or perishingly cold. So if you look at an acute limb ischemia, and this is from, this is the Rutherford's classification, um, and you classify, we classify limb ischemia into three categories. Um, the first category is an ischemic limb that is viable and non-threatened. The second category, or sec um, grade two, is uh, the threatened limb, and grade three is the irreversibly ischemic limb, which is non-salvageable. The Management really we're going to be focusing on today is in the second category or grade two, which is the threatened limb. Um, and what really determines whether or not um, a limb is threatened is whether or not you have an arterial Doppler signal. Uh, and the thing that changes between a threatened limb and an irreversible limb is that you lose your venous Doppler signal. Um, and how do you differentiate between a limb that is marginally threatened um, and you have a few hours um, to work up and treat. Um, and how do you separate that between a limb that is immediately threatened uh, and needs revascularization straight away? It really comes down to whether or not they have any motor loss or motor dysfunction, i.e. muscle weakness. Um, essentially, the moment you start having sensation loss or paresthesia, you automatically tip into the threatened limb category. Um, and the moment that you have profound paralysis um, and no Doppler signals at all is when you end up with an irreversibly ischemic limb. Everything else falls in between. So, so sorry, can I just ask yeah. there, Venice, so in terms of those six Ps, you've mm. got the paralysis and the paresthesia, they're coming towards the end. You'd initially, if someone is initially presenting, they start perhaps with the pale, pulseless leg. Yeah, the, the embolic ischemic legs um, usually present with most, if not all, of the six Ps. And the patient will tell you, and you know it's embolic because the patient will tell you exactly where they were and what they were doing when their limb became ischemic. So they'll say, sure, yeah. we walked out of our bedroom, turned left, took three steps, and suddenly my leg went bad. Yeah. And they usually will tell you all the classic signs. I couldn't feel it. It was numb. It was painful. I couldn't move it. I fell down. Um, so most of those six Ps will come back with the acute embolic episode. Mm -hmm. They're not often, they're not all there at the start for a chronically ischemic um, or a thrombotic right. um, yeah. um, ischemia, and I'll touch on that in a second as to sure. why that is. Um, but the embolic limbs happen mainly because of cardiac source emboli. Right. So usually in people with AF, recent MIs, occasionally valves, um, but by and large it's for AF and recent MIs. Yeah. The incidence had has been decreasing because of the widespread use of um, anticoagulation, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy and the new anticoagulants as well. Um, th there's been some debate as to whether there's been a slight increase in the arterial embolic cases 
now that Pradaxa has come on board, I, I haven't got any level one evidence to show mm -hmm. this is purely observational anecdotal evidence from our department. Um, and that might be because of a number of factors. One, that you can't, uh, you don't routinely measure it, so you mm -hmm. don't know if they're taking the appropriate dose. Sure. And there's also a compliance reason. It's a twice a day dosing as opposed to once a day dosing usually. So they're yeah. more likely to forget a dose and be under therapeutic. Um, and the embolic episodes usually happen in normally or underlying, normally healthy underlying vessels. So they often have a normal arterial examination in the contralateral limb. Um, other sources of embolism, you know, proximal aneurysms, either aortic, subclavian, thoracic aneurysms, uh, are much less common than the cardiac origin emboli. Um, so as mentioned, because they usually have a normal arterial bed before the ischemic event, they, they present with profound ischemia. Mm -hmm. um, and the contralateral limb examination becomes very important because if they have normal arterial exam in the contralateral limb and they give you a very clear-cut story with the six Ps, it's almost certainly an embolic episode. Yeah. Um, they don't have any signs or symptoms of chronic ischemia, um, both when you take a history and also when you examine them. The usual signs of peripheral arterial disease, they are usually not claudicating beforehand. Um, and the commonest sites you'll see it really is in the, the brachial, femoral, and popliteal. So these are, are patients who we otherwise were unaware of any peripheral vascular mm. disease. They didn't come to us with any signs or symptoms of peripheral vascular disease, but it's a, it's a very clear, sudden onset. Yeah, so the, the typical patient will be usually elderly, above 70. They've got AF um, on anticoagulation. They are... They don't have any previous history of claudication. They often don't have the typical risk factor profile. Sometimes they do, but they often don't. Mm. Um, and it is a very sudden event with most of those six Ps yeah. um, with a normal contralateral limb examination. Sure. Now, thrombosis, um, which is what we were getting to before, it, it's a longer course. It's um, less severe because they usually have a degree of underlying arterial disease, which means they have... Uh, collaterals right. beforehand, so they can they can have a much more insidious um, onset really. Mm -hmm. So they're usually claudicating, and they develop on and off paresthesia, and then suddenly go on to occlude what was underlying the underlying disease segment. Right. So they often don't present with the six Ps classically, um, yeah. and a lot of these are due to uh, the low flow states um, or hypercoagulability. Um, graft occlusion, thrombosed aneurysms, dehydration, um, and so on and so forth. So if these um, thrombotic cases are a bit more insidious in onset, is it quite often, um, is the diagnosis a little bit harder? Is it sometimes mistaken for other differences? No, because the examination will show you an ischemic limb. So as soon as mm. you've got an ischemic limb, yeah. then what you're trying to determine is, is this acute, is this chronic? And yeah. usually your history will tell you that. Yeah. Um, and so these thrombos thrombotic cases are usually sort of acute on chronic. So the, the pre-hospital management for, um, for these patients is, um, really comes down to making sure you take a good history, especially a good arterial history, a history about previous interventions, the risk factor profile. Um, as I mentioned, the contralateral limb is very important, and ECG is a useful thing to do just to exclude uh, obvious coronary ischemia or recent coronary ischemia. Um, keep them fasted um, and send them into hospital ASAP. Um, some urgent care uh, facilities and possibly smaller country hospitals mm -hmm. might have access to uh, anticoagulation. Right. Um, yeah. Ideally, avoid clexane mm -hmm. um, and keep with heparin. Um, and the bolus dose, we say, somewhere around 50 to 100 units per kilogram. Um, in an average-sized male, 5,000 is a good round number for mm. the bolus. Um, and start with 10 units per kilo per hour. And if you're in a practice that doesn't have access um, to these, which probably most wouldn't, mm. there's no point giving them aspirin or anything else that you, we would have available? No, no. no, it wouldn't really change anything. Sure. So, as I mentioned, don't bother trying to do unnecessary tests in the community. It's quickest just to get them in. And the, and the question that gets asked often is, how long can a limb be ischemic for? And, and 
in the past, the six-hour rule used to be floated around, you know, after six hours, the limb becomes uh, irreversibly ischemic. It's, that's a good guide, but it's not a hard and fast rule. We've certainly had limbs that have been ischemic for only three hours that have become irreversibly ischemic, and um, limbs mm. that have been ischemic for 12, 18 hours, they're still salvageable. Um, the ones, the embolic events, um, are usually more profound, more dramatic, and the ones that tend to um, have a smaller window mm -hmm. for salvage. Um, and in hospital management, I won't talk about that today, but um, there's a range of options really between surgical thrombectomy, lysis, angioplasty, stenting, bypass, um, and so on. So and in terms of that six-hour rule, I mean, at our practice, sometimes it does take two or three hours for an ambulance to come. So I guess it's just important that we are able to get a priority one ambulance yep. if we are Absolutely. considering this diagnosis. Absolutely. So, I mean, I'll, that's all we... Really going to cover from an acute limb point of view. Are there any questions? Um, on, there is a question here. Is there <clears throat> any point in cooling the limb? No. 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 Um, it probably will only make things worse. Okay. Yeah. Should we move straight along? Yeah, great. Yep. So let's talk about um, aneurysm. So <clears throat> when we talk about aneurysms, you, you broadly break them up into aortic aneurysms and peripheral arterial aneurysms, venous aneurysms are exceptionally rare. Mm -hmm. um, and then aneurysms can do two things, they can block or they can pop, so thrombose or rupture. Um, and the other classification that we need to um, be mindful of is a true versus false aneurysm um, and the difference between the two which I'll touch on in a minute. Mm -hmm. If you look at the aortic aneurysms, there's thoracic aortic and abdominal aortic aneurysms and at the peripheral aneurysms um, we encounter popliteal femoral and um, other false aneurysms usually related to um, intervention or hydrogenic aneurysms. By far the popliteal aneurysms are the most common peripheral aneurysms mm -hmm. um, and the infrarenal abdominal aneurysms um, are much, much more common than the suprarenal thoracic. So out of all these different classifications, which <clears> are the ones we are most likely to see in primary care? Probably the triple A's, infrarenal mm -hmm. triple A's and a popliteal aneurysm. Sure. <clears throat> So, I mean, we, we talked about the true and false aneurysms, and it's, it's a very important distinction to make because it comes down to the risk of rupture. So the difference between a true and false aneurysm really is determined by the extent uh, of the involvement of the arterial wall. So if all three layers of your arterial wall are intact, then it's a true aneurysm. Mm -hmm. If you have a breach in your arterial wall, um, then it becomes a false aneurysm. The false aneurysms have a higher risk of rupture. So usually we have a size threshold at which we would fix aneurysms. Mm -hmm. um, that size threshold usually comes down for a false aneurysm. And so how do you get that breach in the wall? Is that iatrogenic? Or it can be. Um, a lot of false aneurysms are due to iatrogenic um, injury. I mean, especially in this day and age where we're doing more and more minimally invasive procedures, um, both peripheral arterial procedures um, as well as coronary uh, procedures. Um, we often get radial, brachial, uh, false aneurysms related to coronary intervention mm -hmm. um, and femoral false aneurysms related to peripheral vascular intervention. Right. Mm. So, um, in terms of how they can present um, rupture, so in terms of what aneurysms commonly rupture and what aneurysms commonly thrombose, uh, it's a good thing to keep in mind. So, aortic aneurysms rupture mm -hmm. much, much more frequently than they would block. Right. Popliteal aneurysms, i.e. peripheral aneurysms, tend to block much more often than they rupture. Right, and so if they block, you'll get that thrombotic ischemic. Yeah, so a, a thrombose peripheral, a thrombose popliteal aneurysm um, has an exceptionally high rate of limb loss. Mm -hmm. the reason for that is pop popliteal aneurysms are usually filled with thrombus or have a degree of thrombus in it. What happens over a period of time is they tend to embolize small amounts of thrombus into their tibial vessels up until the point where all of the tibial vessels are usually occluded and then you lose your outflow and then the popliteal aneurysm goes on to thrombos. Right. So when it comes time to intervention you don't really you can't really salvage the tibial outflow vessels because they've been occluded for a prolonged period of time. Um, so then um, it's often a non-salvageable limb ischemia. So thrombos mm -hmm. popliteal aneurysm present with profound ischemia. 
And I'm just wondering how we would recognize a popliteal aneurysm. <clears throat> and it's often quite hard to actually palpate yeah. popliteal arteries. Um, so it would just be a very obvious pulsation. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And perhaps asymmetric <laughs> compared to the other side? or 50% of popliteal aneurysms are bilateral. Right, okay, so that's not going to help. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it really comes down to clinical suspicion, really. Um, yeah. if, if you feel a pulse is too good to be normal, mm -hmm. um, then it's probably worthwhile having a look to mm -hmm. see a popliteal aneurysm. Yeah. Um, so rupture is one presenting complaint. Um, ischemia we've just discussed. Um, pain... Again, that really comes down to the abdominal aortic aneurysm. Peripheral aneurysms often don't cause pain unless they're a large false aneurysm, mm -hmm. in which case they can cause pressure symptoms, skin compromise, um, and that can lead to pain. Mm -hmm. The abdominal aneurysms can sometimes cause pain for hours, days, sometimes even weeks before they rupture. So, so it's a so pre-rupture event. A pre okay, so it's an impending rupture. Yeah, and so. obviously when they rupture, they always also have pain, yeah. um, but they can have this prodrome of, um, pain, and often it's either back pain, groin pain, loin pain, abdominal pain, any of the above. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you talk to a patient who has erupted or had erupted aneurysm, they say, look, actually, in hindsight, I've had pain for a little while now. Right. Um, it becomes very difficult, though, sometimes. So these are definitely the patients that we want to try and consider the diagnosis <clears throat> in primary care if they come in with a pre-rupture yep. syndrome. It is. I mean, they can often mask as renal colic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can come in as groin pain. Mm -hmm. um, it, it can be quite difficult. And we've had patients present to hospital to ED mm. with pain and be sent home only to come back with a rupture of the aneurysm. So wow. it, it, you can miss it. <laughs> so apart from considering the patient's vascular risk factors um, in terms of the, the likelihood of this, what are the other clinical features that are going to make us suspect this prodromal AAA? Um, clinical examination, obviously. So if you can feel an aneurysm and they've got um, abdominal pain or back pain, I think you mm. should have a um, low threshold to investigate further mm -hmm. to refer. Otherwise, I think it's just, you just need a high index of suspicion. Mm -hmm. Would you hear to. a brewy as well? No. Not necessarily. Okay. Uh, and, and an abdominal brewy could be anything, really. It could be yeah. a stenosis or something. Yeah. Yeah. Now, pressure symptoms, that they're quite uncommon, uh, and pressure symptoms, if they happen, happen usually with very large peripheral, i.e. popliteal aneurysms that can cause popliteal vein compression or, um, or tibial nerve compression, but it's pretty uncommon. <clears throat> if you look at most people who have a ruptured aneurysm, they usually don't know that they have one, mm -hmm. um, and there's no screening programs um, in New Zealand currently, although we're piloting one in uh, in Auckland um, for the uh, Northland patient, basically, for the Maori mm. patients. Mm. Um, one in 20 men over the age of 65 will have an aneurysm of some size. It doesn't necessarily mean right. only treatment, but they'll have an aneurysm of some size. Um, and the vast majority of the aneurysms are infrarenal. Mm -hmm. um, and that mainly comes down to the elastin concentration in the arterial walls dramatically less infrarenally than suprarenally. Um, it is probably the most life, immediately mm -hmm. life-threatening vascular emergency um, besides trauma um, or along with trauma. Um, and the pre-hospital management is still um, quite variable. So as I said, they usually, but not always, present with um, pain, lower back abdominal pain. Um, and we've talked about the sort of low-grade ache that can be there for several days before mm -hmm. that. Um, and they, they present as you usually would expect, with pain, hypertension, tachycardia, diaphoretic pale. The 50% rule has been quoted in the past, which is 50% of people who have ruptured don't make it to hospital. 50% mm -hmm. of those, those then don't make it through to or through surgery. And then 50% of those don't make it out of hospital. Mm -hmm. It's a very high mortality rate. Right. <clears throat> so the pre-hospital management really centers around permissive hypotension. Um, the systolic blood pressure just needs to be, well, it should be kept as low as needed to perfuse the brain. So it doesn't, we're not really aiming for a number. If they're awake and talking to you, that blood pressure is fine. Because um, I think, I mean, <clears throat> in, in a general practice setting, if I had um, a patient who was hypotensive, tachycardic and pale, and I was waiting for the ambulance, um, my gut would be to 
give them lots of fluids, mm. IV, yeah. but you would suggest not doing that? I would if you think it is a ruptured aneurysm. So yeah. if you can clinically feel an aneurysm mm. um, and you think, yes, this is a triple A, then mm. avoid the um, the need to give them a whole lot of fluids. Uh, right. All you end up doing is hemodiluting them. Okay. Um, and then become coagulopathic and so on and so forth. It becomes harder to deal with. Right. Um, so if you had access to it, give blood over colloid if possible, but often you won't have that in GP practice, mm. but you might have that in the smaller hospitals. Mm. Um, and we don't aim for numbers. Mm -hmm. we try not to aim for numbers. We so People say, oh, we'll, we'll try to get them three-digit blood pressures. Mm. You don't need Just to as do long that. as they're awake, <clears throat> awake and talking to you. Yeah. So as... Increasingly now we're, we're trying to do think more things endovascularly and now we, we, we can do ruptured aneurysms under local anaesthetic wow. um, with uh, endovascular stent grafts and that's, um, that's what it would look like basically at the end of the procedure, just two small incisions in the groin. Um, and that's what a, a stent graft looks like, um, an endovascular stent graft. Um, so they're modular devices, you have um, some sort of material, whether it's nice and old stainless steel, chrome and cobalt. Um, with material attached to it, either Dacron, PTFE, and it goes up through the groins, and we basically reline the aneurysm. So, thoracic aneurysms, um, they're very uncommon. Uh, mortality rate's probably even higher, probably close to 100%. Um, mm -hmm. I've told this story before, but we've had a patient who ruptured a thoracic aneurysm on the vascular ward and died. And you'd expect that that's the best place to be if <laughs> it's you're going to rupture an aneurysm. Right. Yeah. So I, w I wouldn't get too worried about the thoracic aneurysms. Mm. Um, peripheral aneurysms, um, again, they, they rupture very infrequently, but they can they do often thrombose, especially the popliteal aneurysms, um, and they do pre present with profound limb ischemia. And as touched on before, the false aneurysms, um, usually iatrogenic, um, occasionally you can get an aortic false aneurysm because they've um, had a penetrating aortic ulcer or plaque uh, that's had some small sort of small localized rupture. Um, and the mycotic ones are interesting. You usually see them in the IV drug users who inject mm -hmm. into the groins or the brachial arteries mm. um, and now increasingly infected grafts. Right. Mm. I've just got a question here about AAA. Mm. Um, if a AAA is incidental finding on ultrasound, are surveillance ultrasounds recommended? How often? And what degree of aneurysm should we be monitoring closely or referring? So the average aorta, normal aortic size, infrared aortic size is between 15 and 20 millimetres on average. Um, mm -hmm. Small women will have small aortas, larger men will have slightly bigger aortas. So anything above 30 millimetres would classify as ectatic or aneurysmal. Mm -hmm. We usually the threshold for repair is some is around 50 millimeters for women and 55 millimeters for men because at that size the risk of rupture is higher than the risk of perioperative mortality or morbidity. Mm -hmm. um, so anything over 30 should have uh, surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, and so for a 30 to 40 millimeter aneurysm, it's probably appropriate to have a two yearly ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Once they hit 40, and especially between 40 and um, 50, should have 12 monthly. Um, and above 50 should have a six month. And in between 30 and 50 millimetres when you wouldn't be considering surgery, mm. would it be something that the GP would organise those ultrasounds or would you be seeing you, them initially in vascular? You could, but what we're moving to now as a department um, for the Auckland uh, Regional Services, we'll see the patient initially mm -hmm. and we will set them up as part of our surveillance program, which is now going to be done increasingly virtually. Right. So we will organise a scan and the patient yeah. will get a phone call mm -hmm. saying your aneurysm is now four millimetres bigger than it was last time, mm -hmm. which means your next scan is in 12 months' time, which we will organise so you don't actually have to come in and see us, Right. Um, which is a nice system. The patients appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So there is a surveillance program in place for Auckland. So in terms of a GP referring to vascular for an incidental finding of an enlarged aorta an aneurysm, mm -hmm. would that be at 30 millimetres? Yeah, we would still see them, but we mm. probably would scan them in, in two years' time. Right, um, sure. The other alternative is you scan them in two years' time and send them when they're a little bit bigger. Yeah. Either is fine. Yeah, okay. Um, 
So just moving back to the false aneurysms, don't anticoagulate the false aneurysms. Um, it seems obvious, but it has been it has been done. Um, and they usually present as a pulsatile mass at a site of previous intervention. Um, if you think someone's got a pulsatile mass consistent with a false aneurysm, um, all you need to do is refer. Mm -hmm. And they usually will get treatment often on the same day, if not the next day. Right. Um, anything else on aneurysm before we move on? Um, before we move on, actually, I'll just ask, there's a, just give you a couple of questions from the acute limb ischemia mm. section. Um, so one is um, not understanding, someone says, I don't understand why no clexane. Um, mainly because it tends to hang around for a longer period of time. The half-life is about 12 hours or so. Mm. So if you had nothing else and you had to give some sort of anticoagulation, you could give clexane. Um, but everyone will get... IV unfractionated heparin during the procedure anyway. Mm. So you often end up with clexane hanging around, IV heparin, and often aspirin, if they're not already on aspirin and clopidogrel, which a lot of yeah, people are. Right. So it does increase the bleeding risk. Sure. Uh, perioperatively. Um, and one more is, uh, what is critical ischemia? <clears throat> Good question. Definition. So, <laughs> so critical limb ischemia, the, the actual definition is ischemic rest pain or tissue loss for a period of greater than two weeks. Um, with an ankle pressure of less than 50 millimetres of mercury or a toe pressure of less than 30 millimetres of mercury. That's the right. official okay. textbook definition. Um, now, is that a practical definition? Probably not. You're probably not measuring toe pressures. No. Um, you're probably not routinely measuring ankle um, arterial pressures, although that's, you know, we can talk about AVIs another day, but that's mm. something that I think every primary care practice should be able to do. Mm. Um, is to do an ABI. Mm. So if, you, if they have ischemic rest pain or if they have non-healing wounds um, with low peripheral perfusion, that's the definition of critical ischemia. Okay. And in terms of, um, we won't touch on ABIs for peripheral vascular disease screening or anything mm. like that, but if you've got someone who you're not sure if it's a critical ischemia or not, is that a situation in which you would do an ABI with yeah. a symptomatic patient? Yeah, I think yeah. that's a, a, a very good first step. So you do your mm. obvious examination. The rule of thumb is if you've got a good palpable peripheral pulse, you mm. probably don't have critical limb ischemia. Mm -hmm. um, if you have an ankle pressure of greater than 50, um, then you probably don't have critical limb ischemia. Mm. So there's a useful examination, mm. maybe as a useful screening. Right. Mm. Thanks. Actually, I'll just have a look. There's a couple more questions here. Um, are family members ever screened for aneurysms? I have a patient who had a ruptured thoracic aneurysm in his 40s. Otherwise, well, no past medical history. So should that patient's family members be yeah, screened? Yeah, absolutely. Someone who's got a, a history of a very early aneurysmal disease probably has some form of underlying connective tissue disorder or a tissue fragility syndrome. Um, so, that, yeah. So in terms of aortic aneurysms, we say family members should be screened, particularly males. There's not a lot of evidence for screening females, um, but particularly males should be screened for their first ultrasound at the age of 50 or 10 years earlier then the family member's aneurysm was detected, right. whichever comes earlier. Okay. Um, so and, if, it's, and it's males because <clears throat> aneurysms are mainly... Mainly in males, their, yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, if a female has an aneurysm, then uh, it's, there's a higher chance that her um, sons will have it mm -hmm. rather than daughters mm -hmm. um, than if a male had an aneurysm. Right, okay. Um, I'm not quite sure what the reason and the genetics behind that is, but um, generally speaking, yes, they do run in families, mm. so it is worthwhile screening family okay. members. Um, and back to the acute limb ischemia, um, while waiting for an ambulance, giving morphine? Yes, yes. that's fine, absolutely yep. fine. They are, especially the embolic ones, they are quite painful, so mm. it will require a fair amount of analgesia. Mm. Okay, great. Mm. Okay, so moving on. So aortic dissection, um, probably more common than the than a ruptured uh, aneurysm. There, there is a misnomer still going around about a dissecting aneurysm. There, there is no such thing as a dissecting aneurysm. I'm sure I've heard that myself. Yeah. yeah so there is a, an a, there is aortic dissections and there's aortic aneurysms, and there are aortic dissections that can go on to progress and become aneurysmal, but you don't dissect into an aneurysm. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so a, a dissection really means flow um, within the layers of the arterial wall. Um, and the aortic dissections are broadly classified as a type A or type B, depending on um, the location. So if it involves the aortic arch or the ascending aorta, it's a type A. Mm -hmm. Anything that is from the left subclavian down is a type B. Um, 
So that's just a diagrammatic representation of what dissection is like. So there is a breach in the intima, um, and you have a true lumen and a false lumen that develops because of flow within the arterial wall. Aortic dissection, especially acute aortic dissection, is an extremely dynamic process, uh, which you don't really appreciate until you see it in real-time imaging, such as um, um, a toe, mm -hmm. a transverse subtular um, echocardiogram. You can see the flap moving in real time. So what you can develop is you can either get a static related change or a dynamic change, a static ischemia or dynamic ischemia, especially related to the branch vessels. What that means is, um, as you see in the diagram here, so you could have a flap um, that can prolapse into a branch vessel mm -hmm. and then prolapse back out with a cardiac cycle. So you get a dynamic ischemia. Or you could get dissection that actually extends into the branch vessel and causes um, ischemia or occlusion of that branch vessel. It's, a, it's an extremely complex pathology. Um, yeah. So that affects then the kinds of symptoms the patient's getting and perhaps what pulses you can feel and that kind of thing? Yeah, so if you've got arm pulses that are affected, mm. it's by definition a type A because mm. it involves a subclavian artery. Yeah. Um, so you shouldn't really have blood pressure changes in the arm with a type B dissection. You right. can with a type A dissection. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I think this is what it looks like on CT. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see an axial image um, with a, the intimal tear, the intimal flap, um, appreciating a true and false movement. And on the right, you can see just how complex it can look on CT and trying to figure out which one's a true lumen, which one's a false lumen. Mm -hmm. um, and often the false lumen is much larger than the true lumen, and it can actually compress the true lumen. Right. So as, as a rule of thumb, um, most aortic dissections uh, are type A and they usually present with anterior pain. Mm -hmm. um, type B dissections usually present with posterior pain. Mm -hmm. um, type A dissections need repair immediately because they can propagate or involve the coronary sinus and the aortic valve. They could, can cause acute coronary ischemia or mm -hmm. acute valvular incompetence. Yeah. Um, and of course cerebral ischemia can be involved as well. The type Bs um, are usually managed medically first with blood pressure optimization uh, mm -hmm. and pain relief. There has been a push now to try and treat the very high risk type Bs early. Um, and so there's a bit of evidence coming out around that. But the initial management for type B is still medical. Mm -hmm. and the initial management for type A is surgery. So type Bs would still get surgery at N some point after not they've been stabilized? Not necessarily. So if it's a, type, a completely uncomplicated type B, um, they would go into a surveillance program. And if they're developing either branch vessel compromise or developing an aneurysmal degeneration of the aorta, then we would think about intervening in appropriate size. Um, and what I was alluding to before is that, um, that looking at the data, we can identify a subset of patients who are at the highest risk of going on to develop an aneurysm. Um, and so there is now an increasing push to identify that subset and saying these are the people that we should treat early to prevent mm -hmm. that late complication. Mm -hmm. So it says here that they present with severe chest pain. Mm. How is that different to your MI presentation? It can, it Very can, similar? Yeah, it can look exactly the same. It can look exactly the same, especially if they've got the coronary ischemia. Right, so they may coexist. They because, may, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, they will almost all be extremely hypertensive. Mm -hmm. um, with systolics in the 200s at times, um, it can be very difficult to control. They're often on three, four, five antihypertensive, IV antihypertensive agents uh, for control in a hospital. Um, and it could be any of those differentials that I mentioned, you know, mm. that were written on the slide. There could be an MI, it could be a pericarditis, less likely to be a pneumothorax and PE, but still mm. possible. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it just comes down to a, a having a high index of suspicion. And so some of them are quite a lot of them there, you say, 70% are type A, and those are the ones where you can get different blood pressures in each arm. So is that something we should be re kind of routinely doing if we suspect this diagnosis, is checking pulses on both sides, blood pressures on both sides? Yeah, I mean, they can, doesn't mean they all do right, affect yeah. blood pressures. So if you do have a blood pressure differential, mm. which is new, because sometimes you don't know if it's new, because a lot of mm. people are roaming around the community with a blood pressure differential, um, 
if they've got chest pain and do have blood pressure differential, I think it's be completely reasonable to exclude a type A, or mm -hmm. for type A to be the main diagnosis until excluded. Mm -hmm. So low blood pressure is usually um, quite a poor prognostic sign in these dissection patients. Um, it usually means tamponade or impending rupture, or frank rupture. So in terms of examination findings, um, the aortic regurge or valvular insufficiency, pericardial rub, or bad signs, poor prognostic signs, as with jugular dissension. Um, if they've got neurological involvement, that means they usually have a degree of carotid dissection. Again, a very poor prognosticator. What kind of neurological symptoms would they present with typically? Usually lateralizing signs um, or just global cerebral ischemia. So they could mm -hmm. either, if they've involved one carotid, then they can have a lateralizing mm -hmm. hemispheric ischemia. Mm -hmm. um, but if they've got bilateral carotid dissections, they can just present with a low GCS and global severe cerebral ischemia. Right. Do they get distal? I guess so it's just all, all up, it'll be similar to a stroke presentation in terms of the neurological deficits. Yeah, it can be, yes, mm. absolutely. Okay. Hmm. Um, abdominal examination is important um, because I will tell you whether or not there might be a degree of mesenteric ischemia, although they can sometimes be masked by the degree of chest pain. Mm -hmm. um, and pulse examination we talked about is important. And there's a couple of questions here. Um, what is a significant what is significant in terms of blood pressure differentials in the arm? <laughs> Good question. So um, up to 15, 20 millimeters is acceptable mm -hmm. um, within the normal range. Anything more than that uh, would indicate some degree of pathology. And with those, you mentioned it, how it's dynamic. Is that something if you re-measured that things are going to be changing because of those the flat moving in and out? Possibly, but that usually the dynamic changes usually affect the thoracic and abdominal component more so than the Sorry, the right. descending thoracic and abdominal component more than the ascending. Okay. Yeah. Another question here is, when do you operate for type B? Um, good question. So we used to tr we used to not operate unless they had the expanding aortic size or branch vessel complication. But those small subset of patients that we are saying should have earlier treatment um, are the ones that are at a very young age, very large pulse lumen size, very large increased um, aortic size, total aortic size at the time of dissection, people with extreme hypertension that we cannot control. Right. So okay. those are all those are all prognostic signs that would suggest um, that um, they're going to end up with a complication down the track and a very small size of a true lumen. Um, and a question here in terms of when we're seeing these patients, do we call vascular or cardiology um, in terms of who do we refer to initially? Yeah, probably wouldn't call cardiology. It would either be vascular, vascular or, or cardiothoracic or Right. Cardiac surgeons. A lot of that will depend on local practices and policies and politics. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, um, type A goes to cardiac, type B goes to vascular. Right. Ways. But okay. there is some overlap. And I guess as a GP, if we are only considering this as one of many differentials, then they might initially Just go to, go ED. to, to, to ED general yeah. medicine and... Well, they, would, they wouldn't go to general medicine. Oh, well, unless if you're suggesting that they might have chest pain for other MI. reasons. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. they go to ED and get mm. worked up from there. Yeah. Mm. Um, so a type A usually ends up with a surgical replacement of their ascending aorta plus minus aortic arch. Um, and type B we've discussed as medical management versus endovascular repair. And we talked about some of the indications for... Um, repair over medical management. So blood pressure management is very important. Um, it's unlikely you'll be able to achieve blood pressure control in the community before they get to hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and some people have asked um, previously whether they can give GTN. You can give GTN, but what that does is create a reflex tachycardia. Mm -hmm. um, so what we try and do now is give them some sort of a beta blocker or, or hydralazine first and then give them GTN or mm -hmm. sodium nitroprusside, which you probably won't have available in the, in, in the community, but it's mainly in hospital management. So in the community, we will have GTN though. Mm -hmm. Would it be best that we don't give that? Will we wait? If oh, we, no, if you we... can. If, if, if they're significantly hypertensive, whatever you can yeah. do to help yeah. would be great. But often in, they need infusions mm -hmm. to move the pressure. So that's, uh, that's all we're saying on dissections. So any other, any other questions? I think we're okay at the stage, but mm -hmm. just keep texting in your questions if you have any. Um, but I think we can probably move okay. on. So mesenteric ischemia, it can be exceptionally difficult to diagnose acute mesenteric ischemia. 
um, because they present with uh, often actually with without too many signs apart from abdominal pain. Um, so again, high index suspicion is absolutely needed. The acute mesenteric ischemias again are due to an um, embolic cause, often cardiac, um, and they're relatively uncommon in the whole scheme of abdominal pain. Mm -hmm. um, they form less than 1% of all uh, abdominal pain presentations. Um, the true incidence we, we suspect is probably higher than that um, because a lot of people die without an established diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, and again, just like with limb ischemia, um, we do separate them, we do um, categorize them um, embolic versus thrombotic. Um, and the same sort of um, pattern of presentation, really. The thrombotic cases often have a more uh, insidious onset um, because of collaterals. The, the triad of symptoms that are quoted in the in the in the textbooks the, the classic triad um, is severe pain often out of proportion to how they examine so mm -hmm. the abdominal examination might not show a lot of peritonism but they mm -hmm. can be in severe pain mm -hmm. uh, vomiting diarrhea um, is often present mm -hmm. um, and having a source a potential source of embolus and do they how do they typically describe pain or are they lying there still like a peritonism patient or are they no, writhing around or no it can be e either or but mm. most of them are usually lying still mm. um, look very unwell mm. complain about a lot of pain with a relatively benign abdominal examination right. apart from pain mm. but there's no point tenderness guarding mm -hmm. peritonism often right um, most of them are arterial cases. Um, you do get mesenteric venous um, thrombosis or mesenteric um, ve um, venous mesenteric ischemia, which tends to have a better prognosis than the arterial ones. They're often elderly female, and I'm not entirely sure why that is. Um, and it, again, has a very high mortality rate, even if you detect it early. So same sort of thing, really, in terms of um, history. you just got to ask about the risk factors. Uh, compliance with anticoagulants, especially now with the new anticoagulants that we've talked about, there's um, there's no real accountability um, mm. because we don't measure levels anymore. Mm. Um, so we, we don't know whether they're taking it, whether the levels are appropriate. Um, so, and mesenteric angina. So this is mainly for people who have chronic mesenteric ischemia. Occasionally you'll get someone um, who has had a mesenteric angina um, or who has had symptoms of mesenteric angina, mm. and that usually is a history of weight loss, um, a, a fear of eating often, um, because they get significant abdominal pain 30 minutes, 45 minutes after they eat. Mm. Um, and um, so these are the patients that we think, if they have mesenteric angina or a history of mesenteric angina, you think this might potentially be a chronic, acute and chronic mesenteric angina. So they angina. describe it as quite generalised. Yeah, often right. is. unless they've got a, a, a perforated viscous, mm. it's usually generalized abdominal pain. Mm. Mm. Um, don't rely on lactate to help identify um, mesenteric ischemia. It's a, it's a poor sign. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with white count. You can have a normal white cell count right. uh, with acute mesenteric ischemia. Um, and by the time they develop a high white cell count and high lactate, it's usually too late. Is there anything, any other clues if we were to get blood tests done if we're unsure of the diagnosis? Any other clues on those? Not really. Not really. Not really. Um, but like I said, you know, in terms of all the belly pains you see, this would be a very small mm. percentage of them. So we'll be more thinking about the vascular risk factors in terms of that elderly female with AF mm. not taking her anticoagulants. Yep, that's right. <laughs> uh, so diagnosis confirmed with a CT um, and again management for um, a thrombose vessel or occluded vessel, um, the acute setting is IV heparin and we have the usual management options. So any questions so far on that? Uh, no, I think we can move on um, to, I think we will get time for, to look at the trauma then. We will, excellent. Um, vascular trauma is where all the action is really, it's where all the adrenaline is, it's um, a lot of it is what Grey's Anatomy is about. Yeah, um, <laughs> and I mean a lot of this is going to go straight to hospital, but occasionally in general practice we might see a little bit of it. Yeah, and especially in the in the smaller towns. Mm. Um, so in terms of taking a history in a trauma setting, really um, I think no matter what course you take as an ATLS or EMST mm. or Prime, mm -hmm. um, you just need to take a very succinct but focused history. Mm 
um, really should revolve around their medications, allergies, what the past medical history is, when they last ate, and, mm -hmm. but most importantly, what actually happened. Mm -hmm. um, from a vascular point of view, what we look at is um, hard signs and soft signs. So this is what tells us whether or not they definitely have an arterial injury or might have an arterial injury, and that will change our management. Anyone with a hard sign uh, would go straight for operative management. Anyone with a soft sign will either be managed conservatively or will get imaging before proceeding to treatment. Um, so anyone who's got is acute ischemia, um, active pulsatile bleeding, pulsatile hematoma or a brilliant thrill um, has got an arterial injury until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, anyone who's got reduced pulses, a neurological deficit but not, not necessarily an arterial deficit, um, hypertension um, and an injury or trauma in the region of major vessels, there will all be soft signs for trauma. So the management principles really are to stabilize and, and transport. Um, and I write, avoid Chinese whispers here because what tends to happen is uh, you, you have an event, um, the people who are witnesses tell the ambulance officers, the ambulance officers tell the ED officers, the ED officers then tell the, yeah. uh, the trauma team. And the story does change slightly. Yeah. It's really useful as people who are involved very early on in the course to write down mm -hmm. the story, and that can just be passed on. Mm. Um, damage control principles won't get too much uh, too much into that. Um, so the, what you can do really is large bore IV access. Um, again, resuscitate with colloid if you have to. We don't have the same sort of permissive hypertension rule um, as we do with ruptured aneurysms. Mm -hmm. um, but again, try over resuscitating with colloid. If you have a penetrating injury, please don't pull out the object. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, and generally speaking, tamponade is a good thing. It will work in your favour. Um, even if you have a hemithorax full of blood, mm -hmm. the tamponade can work in your favour. Okay. The only time tamponade is definitely bad is the pericardium. Cardiac, yeah. Mm. Um, please don't try and attempt vascular repair. Um, it can make things a lot worse. Um, what kind of things do you see people try to do that, that make it worse? Um, I've, we've seen people try to tie off vessels. Right. In their veins, we've seen people try to take a s stitch to try and stop the bleeding, mm -hmm. um, which has just made things worse. Mm. Um, so, And we've seen various hemostats or clamps on things, mm -hmm. um, and all that does is damage the vessel. Right. <laughs> um, now, bleeding um, is what worries most people, but it's mm -hmm. also relatively easy to deal with in that most bleeding can be controlled with one finger. Okay. Um, and the other 10% of the rest of the bleeding can be controlled with a hand or a mm -hmm. fist. Um, and if you can't control the bleeding with a hand, then you're in real trouble. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'll talk about tourniquets in a second. Mm. Um, so the seven Ps of hemostasis that, you know, at least I try to teach all our registrars that come through the unit, um, really it comes down to how is it, what are the options for managing bleeding? Mm. Um, and the two most important are pressure and patience. Okay. Put pressure on it and just be patient. Mm -hmm. um, call for help, but pressure mm. and patience. And then come all the other options for treating um, bleeding, which we'll get into more now. So there's proline, which is suture, packing, products, platelets, um, and other hematological adjuncts. Um, and if all that uh, fails and you pray. Hey. Yeah. So we, we, I try to drum that into all our trainees. Um, tourniquets, um, they are useful adjuncts. Um, just be mindful not to overuse it. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you've got an injury at the wrist, you mm -hmm. don't need to tourniquet the arm. Right, okay. Um, if you can stop the bleeding with manual compression, that's by far preferable to tourniqueting a limb. Right, yeah. Because um, all you do is render the entire limb ischemic, mm. and the first is just occluding that vessel. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they are sometimes oh, useful. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Sometimes useful. And especially, it, it can be useful if you don't know where the bleeding is coming from to tourniquet, mm. and just try and reassess the situation, and perhaps mm. either shift the tourniquet or find the site of bleeding and press on it. Mm -hmm. Um, neck trauma, I won't go into it too much, um, this really comes down to surgical management really, um, but anything below the level of the cricord will usually need a stenotomy, anything above the level of the angle of the mandible will need some form of embolization, mm -hmm. um, anything in the middle 
um, usually goes for surgical exploration yeah. from arterial point of view. Um, again, this is mostly in hospital stuff, mm. um, so I'll just briefly touch on it. Um, but we, we try not to um, surgically explore uh, hematomas in the perinephric space uh, unless they're expanding. Um, and, and with pelvic injuries or pelvic trauma, uh, we, we pack them, we stabilize them, immobilize them, and then embolize whatever's bleeding. So that's all I really had to say on all that. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks very much, Benno. Right. I do have, uh, and, and um, to our audience, if you can continue to send in any questions that you would like um, Benno to answer um, as we finish up. I have a question here, or a comment really. Um, a case of mesenteric ischemia that this person saw that was diagnosed by urgent ultrasound done under POAC um, because the patient didn't want to go to hospital. Ultrasound showed thickened, edematous small bowel wall and they had a CT straight to the theatre, had most of their bowel removed um, and the patient was male and in his 40s. So diagnosed on ultrasound, I guess that's another occasional thing that might happen and it's exceptionally it's rare. Pretty rare. Okay. Yeah. Exceptionally rare. Most people will be willing to go to hospital if they've got significant belly pain. <laughs> yeah, well, I often find patients who I'm struggling to convince to go to hospital despite them looking like they mm. need to. Yeah, sometimes it's quite a... Yeah, I, suppose, I suppose we yeah. don't see that side of things. We yeah. don't see that people who do come into hospital. You do, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah. Um, so, I mean, in terms of the things that I am most scared about as a GP in, in terms of missing, would be, from what you've talked about so far, would be probably that mesenteric ischemia, um, the kind of pre-rupture ache of a AAA. Mm. Um, and I guess the aortic dissections probably are the type of patients that I would send to hospital anyway in terms of considering an MI. Mm -hmm. um, but those, that kind of, the, the tummy stuff is probably still something if it's not if it's very clear cut a hypotensive pale tachycardic patient I think I would know what to do mm. um, but that kind of subacute or slightly less obvious pain yeah they, they are hard I'm not sure there is a, a magic solution or easy answer to mm. that as, as long as you're aware that that can happen mm. um, and do a good clinical examination I'm not sure mm. what else you can do really I, there's an increasing amount of ultrasound use now, um, mm. both in the ED setting, but probably also in the community setting as people yeah. are doing more and more ultrasound yeah. courses. Um, we're all very comfortable using ultrasounds ourselves as part of our routine practice. Mm. Um, I'm not sure how many GP practices would have an ultrasound machine. Um, yeah, and I think, I mean, probably not, probably rural practices at this stage um, might have one, but I think it is an area that it seems like more and more in the future, more and more practices may consider that. Yeah. Um, and I think... At our next Goodfellow Symposium, we're hoping to get maybe um, some ultrasound clinics or something there. If you were, in terms of these two cases, mesenteric ischemia and AAA, what are you going to see on an ultrasound? A AAA. You're going to see a really <laughs> You're going to see an obvious way. AAA, yeah. So yeah. An, uh, an aortic ultrasound is actually not that difficult unless the patient um, has got a lot of bowel gas or is quite overweight. Mm. Um, because you know where the aorta is, it's in the midline of the abdomen. Um, so you just place your probe just above the umbilicus in a transverse orientation, mm -hmm. um, and you just look for the round circle, really. Mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. if, and if the round circle is reasonable size, it's not a rupture AAA, the round circle looks big, then you'd think, okay, the pain has got an aneurysm. Mm -hmm. It might be a symptomatic non-ruptured aneurysm. Yeah, and they do this in, in the ED all the time, don't they? Yeah, the yeah. ED doctors. Yeah, but they have... They do a lot of fast scanning as well, so they're used to ultrasound. Yeah, routinely. yeah. You said that the AAA is not only with midline pain, but can present with groin pain, mm. back pain. Often so we've also got pain. to consider this diagnosis when you've got someone presenting with back pain or kind of renal colic type, you know, lateralizing pain. Yeah, there's a lot of people who have been diagnosed with renal colic who come in with a, a ruptured aneurysm. Um, it's easy for us to say, I can't believe they didn't consider a AAA, <laughs> but you, know, you must see hundreds we of see patients. We see a lot more renal colic than ruptured That's AAAs. Right. So I don't think it's a fair comment from our side to say that. As mm. long as you're considering it in your differential diagnosis, that's all we can really ask. Mm. And 
just see if I've got any more questions here. Um, if we are suspecting AAA in a large patient, who to refer to ED? I'm not quite sure about that one, sorry, I'll ask another one. So do patients with mesenteric ischemia need anticoagulation for life? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. It depends on why they had the mesenteric ischemia. So if they've got an underlying either an embolic source mm -hmm. um, or a peripheral source of embolization, i.e. a peripheral aneurysm or mm -hmm. something of that sort, then potentially. Mm -hmm. um, but for the chronic mesenteric ischemias, um, we usually don't anticoagulate them. Right. We, re we revascularize them, we put them on antiplatelet agents, but often we don't anticoagulate them. Right, okay. Um, a couple of questions I'm not sure about here. What's the wait time we can do on POAC? I think um, in terms of ultrasound, if you're referring to ultrasound, primary options might allow you to do an ultrasound on the day. But otherwise, a lot of these conditions we're talking about are really transfer to hospital mm. kind of situations, aren't they? It's just a matter of being able to recognize the diagnosis yeah. and get the person there quick enough. Um, any other questions from our audience or anything else you want to tell GPs about? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of things I could tell you about. <laughs> um, no, I, I think the message that I've been trying to get across consistently over the last little while is if you have any doubts, um, we're only a phone call away. Mm. Um, just pick up the phone and call us. Um, most of us... Um, will not get upset if you call to have a discussion mm -hmm. um, or just to get some advice. Mm -hmm. We'd rather that than you miss a diagnosis or uh, a patient get the wrong treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so please do call us. We are accessible and we're usually fairly reasonable people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm happy to come and help. I mean, I've already helped a couple of groups because they wanted to set up an ABI, mm -hmm. um, peripheral arterial disease screening type program. Mm -hmm. um, happy to come and help. Mm -hmm. um, because the more awareness we can raise in the community, I think it would be better for the for all of us, really. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And actually, in terms of um, the you know getting your patient, if you're considering that AAA ruptured AAA, you get your ambulance straight away. Do you then, in terms of getting them to a hospital that has vascular surgery, I assume that not all hospitals are going to be able to take acute. No, but the ambulance officers usually know yeah. which hospitals. So as long as we make it clear what our yeah. suspected diagnosis is. But you would normally do that anyway, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. They'll know. To yeah, the ambulance right officers are usually pretty good. Yeah. Mm. Um, we have uh, one of my colleagues has been requesting ultrasound scans on patients with pulsatile aorta, even if they don't have risk factors. I guess that's just a question about when would you be doing ultrasound scans to screen for AAA, which is a, almost another talk in itself. But. It is. Um, I would hope most people would have a pulsatile aorta. Yeah. Um, I think with them, <laughs> what they're referring to is um, perhaps a query aneurysm or yeah. aorta. Um, when would you screen? That's a, that's a big discussion. So mm. um, if you suspect someone has an aneurysm and they are over... 60 or 65 and they're male and they're smokers and that's a reasonable thing to do yeah um but there's very low yield if you start screening everyone right. who's got a pulsatile aorta i mean yeah. a lot of thin people will have a palpable aorta mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean they've got an aneurysm yeah mm -hmm. and i guess if we're doing an abdominal examination or a general checkup on a male 60 year old mm -hmm. it would be a reasonable thing to examine for as yeah well. absolutely yeah absolutely uh, can palpating the abdomen cause a AAA to rupture? No. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, that, no. Would, that would be very scary. Um, that would put us all off examining anybody. No, 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 no. Just it won't. You'll be, you'll be right. <laughs> okay, good. Good question. Um, and I'll just see if I've missed any questions scrolling down here. Um, I think that is probably it. So... Um, I will just bring us back to our screen here. Uh, so thank you very much, Vina. It's been right. um, a great talk, and I've learned a lot, and I hope you all have as well.
Um, so thank you to Bernu Bamedi for joining us tonight and thank you also to the Goodfellow Unit and to Paul Keogh who's been here helping us with the IT. Um, if you have any questions or any feedback um, then please email us. You will be getting an email um, sent to you in a few days time um, about the webinar so you can then reply to that if you've got anything you want to feedback um, and just have a look at our website goodfellowunit.org. Thanks.